have been or are climbers or want to be? Okay. Oh, okay, okay, we got a handful, okay. Or want to, or dream of being, how's that? <laughs> How many of you are afraid of heights? Anybody with any common sense should have their hand up, yeah. But it's not the height you're afraid of, it's falling off the height, right? Right, right, okay. Um, hi, Kwan, and move, up, move on down so you can see and hear everything. I don't mind if you have, oh, I, I, I know everybody here is on a schedule. I don't mind if you have to get up and go, you know, leave. Uh, I understand that. Um, how many of you are parents? Or grandparents, of course. Yeah, yeah. okay. That helps because it's, this is sort of a parent's kind of thing. I'm, a, I'm the mom. Uh, for 10 years or so, every time I attended a presentation about my son, how, uh, oh, before I go on, how many of you have seen Free Solo? Great movie. <laughs> How many of you noticed me in it? <laughs> I'm in it for about four seconds. It wasn't a mom story, it was an Alex story. But um, for about 10 years, every time I go to any of the showings of any of the videos and movies about him, every, every, I could hear people muttering, how would you like to be that kid's mother? <laughs> yeah, well I am. And I've lived to tell the tale. So today we're talking about the sharp end. Anybody know what sharp end means? You climbers in the room, what's the sharp end? <laughs> okay, we'll get into that later. It's a climbing term, but okay, later. <laughs> First, my magic clicker. I hate all this stuff. How many of you have seen El Capitan in person? How many, anybody here never been to Yosemite? You've never been to Yosemite? Yes, it is. It's only three and a half hours from here. People come from all over the world, literally. They come from all over the world to go see that. Put that on your, your wish list for Christmas or something. Don't go at Christmas time, but uh, when the weather's a little better. Uh, um, so El Capitan, my son spends a lot of time. He just made history there last week and the week before that and the week before that. But I won't get into that, that's a long story. But he calls this the most inspiring big wall in the world. And he knows his stuff. He knows the, all the big walls in the world. And he always comes back to this one because it truly is the most inspiring. If, if you ever go there, I love to watch people who, who drive in for the first time. They just, you know, lose all, you, there are no words. There really are no words for El Cap, for the whole valley. Um, a big wall, that term we all need to understand before we go further. Uh, a big wall in climbing is a wall, usually granite, usually pretty vertical. And it's called a big wall because most climbers, even the elite climbers, take more than a day, sometimes more than many days, to climb it. Okay, that's what the term big wall means. Okay, so when they climbers say that's a beautiful big wall, they're not just describing it. That's, uh, that's the designation, okay? We're gonna go back in time first so you can understand this story. That's me, me and my big bro. That's me and John uh, on West 43rd Street in, in Manhattan. I started, uh, started life in Manhattan and grew up in Queens mostly. And um, New York City was a vastly different place back then, a vastly different place. Um, this is after World War II. And New York City was absolutely overrun with immigrants first, and, but after the war, they called them displaced persons. Nowadays, we call them refugees, but they call them displaced persons. Even on the license plate, it said DP, if you got one. And so New York was a, a, a maelstrom of languages, of cultures, and that's how I grew up. That's how I wound, I've been teaching languages all my life. And I've taught five different foreign languages on many continents, many places. And this is how it all started. Um, grandparents spoke Polish. My whole family's from Poland. Grandparents spoke Polish, but after World War II, you know, all those students who are here, you all study World War II history somewhere? You know what I'm talking about? After the war, nobody wanted their kids to speak anything but English, right? We had one. We were Americans, we were gonna speak English. 
So we couldn't talk to our grandparents. It's an unusual way to grow up. You know, the, uh, all the old people around us spoke whatever in the house, you know, whichever house we were at, and all the kids spoke English. And so my love of languages and my love of music came from that. We're going to see a little bit about how those turned out later. But um, every house, the house, the street I lived on in Jackson Heights in Queens, there were about 50 houses, 52 houses down the street. Every one, it seemed, was from a different country. I mean, there were people from all over the world, and they all had their own music, and I loved that. And there, everybody had instruments like this. And, and you know, there were no CDs or, or even record players were, they were too expensive. You know, these people were immigrants. And this is, so that was the, the basis of how I grew up. When I got to about this age, this is about 25, I decided that it was time to see the world a little bit. I had been to France. I had done a, a, a year in France, a, this junior year abroad. And that kind of sort of broadened my horizons. I mean, growing up in New York, your horizons are vast, but not personally experienced, you know? So I wanted to see what California was like. California was the land of exotica. I don't know if you ever thought about that, but in other places, I mean, I grew up in the east. It snows, you know, the, the four seasons, the winter is pretty grim. California had palm trees. I had never seen one. It had lots of blonde-haired people. I'd never seen that either, not, not growing up in New York. It had earthquakes, all these exotic things, you know? And so I, I longed to go out there and test the waters, as it were. So I moved out to California, and I met my husband-to-be. Some of you knew him, Charlie. And uh, we got married, and we looked for jobs. Both of us taught English as a foreign language. For me, it was one of the five languages I taught. So I could have gone anywhere in the world, but Charlie taught English as a foreign language. So we got jobs in the University of Tokai in Japan. Anybody here from Japan or been to Japan? Oh, OK, a little bit. Um, and while we were there, we were there about four years and old, long enough for me to have my first baby there and then second baby was born in this country, just barely came back when I was eight months pregnant. <laughs> they probably wouldn't let you do that nowadays, but they did then. And then we settled into West Sac. Anybody from West Sac here? West Sac? So West Sacramento was a non-place when we lived there. <laughs> there was nothing there but houses. There was nothing, not a store, not a movie, not nothing. It was just houses. Now it's a city. It's a real bona fide city with shopping centers and restaurants and stuff. But there was nothing there when I lived there. And, and so every weekend we would uh, load up the kitties and go explore. California is a great place to live if you love to explore the outdoors, right? How many of you do that? on a regular basis, go explore the outdoors. California is outstanding for that. And so we took our kids from this age on, before, before the age of one, uh, for him and her, she's two years older than he, um, we took them out camping and, and hiking and got them accustomed to the outdoors right away. And uh, during that period, living in West Sac, uh, it was kind of, kind of like living in a ghost town for me because I was home alone with the kids. Charlie would drive to this college and that college. He was what they call a freeway flyer. You know what that means? Right? He drove from school to school to school and taught wherever he could get classes. Uh, it's a horrible way to live. <laughs> it's a very uh, unsettling way to live. So he was always gone, and I was always home with the two darling little kids. <laughs> I loved my time with my kids, but I never saw another adult. I never saw anybody. All the adults worked. And all their kids went to daycare. And so the, during the day, we were a threesome. That's it. We, <laughs> we you know, explored the world together, had a great time with them. But it was a very unusual way to live. I don't know, never thought about it, but living alone, in, surrounded by city, but not really in the city. It was kind of weird. So this is the only way to use a swing set, right? Right? This is how Alex always played with every toy. Swing set. This is, he's almost two in this picture. So at the age of two, he could hold himself up and he could swing himself up and do a heel hook. Heel hook is when you hook your heel over something and use it to support you. And then he would go up to the top bar and work his way across. <sighs> That's how I felt every day. 
And his sister learned, Stacia learned to just back off, give him space, because he knew what he was doing. And he rarely ever fell. And if he fell, he just laughed and get back up and do it again. So this is, uh, this is when I started to realize that life was going to be a little bit different. <laughs> a little bit different raising him. So while they, was home, while they were home, I was always home. Like, and when they got to about three, I guess it was, it went to uh, Tiny Tot Time. If I remember Tiny Tot Time in, in Land Park. Um, so they were gone some of the time, and I started to juggle jobs because Charlie's biggest mantra was, we have no money. We don't have no money. We don't have no money. So anytime I could, and I could do a lot of things, I could teach. I could write. I've been a writer all my life, you know, articles and, and essays and books and lots of stuff. And uh, I've been a tour guide for a large part of my life, um, a multilingual tour guide, groups from other countries, give them to me. Uh, and so I would juggle all these jobs while while the kids were either in daycare, not daycare, but um, what's that called? Uh, hmm? Preschool. Okay, preschool. Let's call it preschool. And I also did fell into my biggest opportunity in, in West Sac. I had always, growing up in New York, you know, listening to a lot of music, I had uh, taken advantage of... Uh, all the music in New York. I'd gone to concerts all the time in the, in the city in uh, Central Park. Anybody been to Central Park? It's a huge, huge park. And it's, culturally, it's rich. They do all kinds of events and, and concerts. And all summer long, there are concerts. So I, got, I grew up watching Leonard Bernstein and, and um, what's, the, what's the little? Mm, Aaron Copeland. Yeah, they, they were all in New York. And that's how I grew up. Um, so. This was my chance. In West Sacramento, there was nothing there, you know, culturally, no stores, no nothing. So I approached them and said, what would you think of the idea of the West Sacramento Community Orchestra? Whew. They thought the, the Chamber of Commerce thought it was a great idea. And so I ran with it, and I, I conducted that for four years. And they're still going. As a matter of fact, this coming Sunday, they're doing their um, Christmas concert in West Sac, so, and, and it's open to the public. It, it's free and open to the public. So anybody, everybody's invited. You should all come with me. I'm going. Um, I conducted that for four years, and then we moved to this side of town, Carmichael, and uh, it was just too much of a hassle with the kids and the jobs and stuff. So five years old. This is Alex. This is what a five-year-old climber looks like. I was doing a book called Sacramento with Kids. Anybody seen it? A little pink book for traveling around the region with kids. And uh, I came across, uh, uh, my kids are my test experts. I took them to everything. And if they didn't like it, it's probably not in the book, you know, because that that's what it was for. You know, I wanted their opinions on it. And I found out about the Rocknasium. Back then, the Rocknasium, it's a climbing gym in Davis, and it was the only climbing gym around back then. You know, this is like 30 years ago. And there were no others. Nobody had heard of climbing back then as a sport. You know, nowadays, every, it's in the news. It's in the, you know, it, it's on TV and stuff. But back then, nobody had heard of climbing as an organized thing. I hadn't either. And so I found out about the Rocknasium and thought to myself, no way. That would be totally irresponsible to take this kid to a place like that, built for climbing the walls. I spent my entire life trying to get him down from stuff. You saw him on the on the on the swing set. Yeah. That's how I spent my life trying to you know watching him and, and trying to get him to come down. So I knew I couldn't take him there. But but and I agonized for many months over that as, as I wrote the rest of the book. And then finally I I decided okay I'm going to make a list of questions, be there for five minutes, and then we'll be out. And that's not how it turned out. So we got there and, and I looked up and said oh no, oh. and Alex was in heaven. So this is uh, that day. <laughs> this is how we spent our life. Stacia, my daughter, in the costume on the ground, on the ground. She and I were perfectly content to go trick-or-treating on the ground. Not Alex, never. And on the right, that's in, uh, on, in Long Island in New York. She and I were perfectly content to walk to the playground on the ground. But not Alex. He always found another way to do everything. To walk through the house, he found other ways. You know, stand on the counter, grab the fan, and leap to the... Oh. So this is how uh, 
I spent my life dealing with this, what would you have done? You never know. I didn't know what I know now. I didn't know how good he was. I didn't know how secure he was in what he did. He knew, but he never bothered tell, slowing down to tell anybody about it. But so I spent my entire life trying to get him down from stuff or slow down. It, it didn't work. <laughs> And then I hit this period of time that I call the black hole. Um, it was absolutely horrible. I don't know how I survived it, but I did. I just went from day to day. People died left and right. I lost my mother. Then next year, I lost my father. And then the next year, we lost our, my father-in-law. And then the next year, my husband died. And then that same year, my son almost died. He died in a horrible accident up, almost died in a horrible accident up on Mount Tolak. You know where that is? That looms over Lake Tahoe. It's the big mountain, almost 10,000 feet that looms over Lake Tahoe. So all this was going on year after year. I never had a moment to regroup or to think or to, to grieve or any of that stuff. And with every death, I got more jobs. I was executor of this person's estate. And then I was executor of this person's estate too. And then I was remodeling three houses in Pennsylvania from here while working full time. And then I was remodeling another house in Sacramento, and then, and then, and then, and uh, uh, the whole period is just a black hole in my memory. I just blocked it out, and that's, it went on and on. I mean, I didn't have time to talk to anybody about it, because I didn't have time, period, at all. I'd, I'd come here, do my job, did a great job, <laughs> if I do say so myself, rush home, change my clothes, go down the hall and become the executor and the house remodeler. And I'd spend my time calling, you know, ordering big appliances and carpeting and, and, and heating oil for Pennsylvania. It was just crazy. So during, the reason I'm telling you all that is during all that time, my son was becoming famous and famous and more famous and more famous. You've probably seen you know, magazine articles about him, National Geographic magazines, movies and all videos thousands of videos about him. And I would see the magazine, I'd say, oh, that's nice, and I'd put it you know, on the table, I'd give it to Grammy or whatever, and I'd run down the hall and keep working. That's all I did. I didn't have time to process what was going on with his life because of all that was going on in my life. And during all this time, my daughter and son, both of them, they're both extreme athletes. Um, she. She's a very good climber, but that's not her sport of choice. But this is. She is a long-distance cyclist and a long-distance runner. And so they're all out there having these wonderful adventures, both of them out there having these wonderful adventures, and I'm stuck at my desk. And then I was stuck at my desk until like 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night every day, and then 5.30 every day up, go to AR and back. And, and I watched them, and they were so happy. <laughs> And I just watched him come back from these adventures. And Alex would leave on, a, on an expedition, then he would come home, and he'd tell me all about it. And I didn't speak that language. I didn't know what he was talking about. You know, he would tell me where they went, what they did, what they climbed, what gear they used. And it meant nothing to me because I didn't have time to learn it. And, but I wanted some of that. I wanted some of that joy. They were very, very happy doing what they were doing. And they could kind of tell that I wasn't. <laughs> and so they, they encouraged me to, to join once in a while. And once in a while, I could squeeze in a day or two or, and join them. This is bicycling up in Portland. My daughter lives in Portland, Oregon. Yes, she lives in Portland, Oregon. And uh, is this the next picture? Oh, we're going to take a little back tour here. Um, so they both got me into running because running was the only thing I could do for myself. I would work it here, here at AR. I'd go home and work as the, the whatever I was doing until 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, whatever it was. Then I would take the dog out for a walk. However, my dog was this big. It was a Malamute, you know, big uh, Alaskan sled dog. Big, long legs, built for pulling. And so I, you know, walked the dog like this. And then I started jogging myself and I jog and run with the dog. And uh, kind of, the, the kids could see it happening, I guess. And little by little, um, oh, let's go back here. I would, I, would, I would come home, and once in a while, Alex, Alex comes in and out, in and out. Back then, he still lived at home, but not really. I mean, he was off on expeditions, mostly. So he would come home to, to restock, you know, do his laundry stuff. And once in a while, I'd come home, I'd 
come home at 12 or 11.30 at night with the dog, and I go, yo, Alex, I just ran a mile. I was beside myself. I had, I had reached my pinnacle. I ran a mile. Because when back in those the days of New York, living, growing up in New York, um, nobody then knew about secondhand smoke. Our house was a solid cloud of cigar and cigarette smoke. I don't know if you've ever lived next to somebody like that, but it's pretty awful. And so anything more strenuous than you know getting up from my chair, and I was huffing and puffing. So I knew, quote unquote, knew that I couldn't, I couldn't do anything strenuous. Uh, what do you call it? Sustained, you know. So I come home, yo, yeah, well, Alex, I ran a mile. And Alex, Alex's response to that changed my life. Totally changed everything. And I had never thought about it this way before, but once he said it, I said, huh. He said, oh yeah, cool, Mom. If you can do a mile, you can do a mile and a half. Well, I was deflating. Okay, yeah, cool. Okay, but, but true. Defading, but true. And I started thinking about that. I ran a mile. I didn't think I could even do that. Come on in, come on down, yeah. And so I, I continued doing what I was doing. They continued doing what they were doing. And next time Alex came through the house, okay, before I go on any further, any climbers here? Climbers in the new bunch? No climbers? Ah, too bad. <laughs> So next time I came, yo, Alex, ah, I just ran two miles. Hi. And, and so I was, you know, I figured that that was it. I reached my peak. And so Alex's take, of course, oh, cool, mom, two miles, pretty good. If you can do two, you can do three. Now, if you think about that, none of us have any limits. You know, if you really think about it, if you can do two, you can do three. When you get to three, what are you going to do? You're going to stop. No. Okay, so I started thinking about it and thinking about it and, and running with the dog some more. And then I'd leave the dog home and go running just for me. And, and this, is, this is me doing the Lake Tahoe half marathon. And half marathon is 13.1 miles. It's that point one that really gets you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How many of you have done a half marathon? Oh, yeah, very good. Oh, good. All right. Yeah. Anybody here done a marathon? Ooh, I'm impressed. <laughs> I'm impressed. That was my next step. You know, I took Alex's advice and, and I kept pushing that little mileage thing a little more, a little more. And this is the California International, 2006. And, uh, and on and on. So I'm a runner now and, and sort of kind of an athlete, semi kind of. I never thought of myself as an athlete because I never did anything like that. I'd ride my bike and go ice skating, but, you know, just... No, nothing big, nothing sustained. Um, but now I was a marathon runner. Hey, marathons, semi-marathons, uh, half marathons. And so I figured maybe now I could begin to understand what my son was doing out there. You guys you, who all just came in new, have you seen the movie Free Solo? Some of you have, some of you haven't? Okay, you know who Alex Honnold is? Okay, I'm his mom. <laughs> um, so I figured maybe I could understand what it was talking about when he came back from these expeditions. So I asked him to take me to the climbing gym. Now, by this time, um, earlier I talked about the climbing gym in Davis, and that was the only one back, back then that was the only one around. Um, by this time, 2009, there were several. There are two others now in the Sacramento region. And so I had Alex take me there, show me how to do what you needed to do, how to tie in, and what things were called. You know, I didn't speak, I didn't know the vocabulary. And climbing has a very specific jargon. I don't know if you've ever seen a climbing movie or heard climbers talking, but the words are different. You know, it's a different jargon. They talk about things that you won't understand unless you've done this and, you know, learned the vocabulary. So, and I'm a language person, you know, I, I wanted to learn the vocabulary and speak the language because it was my son's whole life. I could see that already. It was his whole life, and I really wasn't a part of it just because I didn't speak the language yet. So I had to fix that. You know, I'm a language person. I had to fix that. So, so we went, and, and I started making friends with people who climbed, and uh, they started taking me outdoors. Uh, anybody know what I'm doing on the picture on the left? What's that called? Anybody know? Repelling. Oh, very good. Good crowd. <laughs> yeah, repelling is when you hold your own rope and you back down the rope, back down the rock, the rock face or whatever you're on. 
And my daughter said I had to include this picture. She said, Mom, that's a badass picture. You have to use that one. This is in New York State. There's a lot of cl good climbing all over the world, and, and I've just begun to sample it all over the world, and it's really exciting. So this is me in, in climbing in New York State. Uh, the gunks, anybody heard of the gunks? New climbers? The gunks? No? Doesn't ring a bell? The Shawangunk Mountains, they call them the gunks. And this is my friends taking me outdoor climbing. It, totally different from indoor climbing. Totally different. Just a different animal altogether. And, and they took me out, they were very patient with me, and I learned, and I learned, and I learned. This is in Yosemite. Then this new group, have you all been to Yosemite? Anybody not? Oh, we gotta fix that. <laughs> gotta fix that. This is Stacia and me, my daughter and me, um, and Smith Rock up in Oregon. Oregon has her own outstanding climbing. Uh, once in a while, I get to lead climb. Probably doesn't mean anything to most of you, but there are, there are two people on a rope. You know, so you both tie into both ends of the rope. First person who climbs up puts in gear in the rock and then attaches the rope to that gear so that if he falls off, he just dangles from that gear. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, the person on the ground belays. Belay means you manage the rope and you're ready at a seconds, a split seconds notice, if they fall, you lock off the rope so that they just dangle and they do hit the deck. <laughs> okay, does that make sense? You got that picture up here? So once in a while, so the, 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 the top end of the rope th that the person's taking up with him is different from in the gym. In the gym, the rope is already up there, okay? But the top end of the rope is called the sharp end. Yeah, the sharp end, that's why the name of the book is The Sharp End, because my entire life has been lived on the sharp end. The sharp end is more dangerous, it's more consequential. If you fall, worse things can happen to you than if you're the follower on the rope. You know, It's a lot more consequential, that a lot more things can go wrong, a lot more stress, and especially up here, a lot more, a lot more danger up here, because you have to... Climbing is a, almost entirely a cerebral sport, and that surprised me about it. All the other sports, you know, you get fit enough, you can play most anything, you know, a little bit. But climbing, you have to figure out things. It's a, they, they call them boulder problems because you are figuring out your way up the rock. And you have to know a little bit about physics. You know, if I fall here and the rope is over there and my belayer is over there, which way am I going to fall? What am I going to hit when I fall? You know, how much stress can the rope handle? All those things you've got to think through. So once in a while, I get to climb at the sharp end of the rope. That's the picture on the right, that's me on the sharp end, me leading the climb, putting the rope up, and that's my daughter on the bottom. It was a lot of fun. And of course, my best, best, overall best guide and tutor in the sport, of course, is my son, Alex Honnold, the, probably the best climber in the world, although he says he's not. But uh, there are stronger climbers than him, but there are no climbers who can do what he does out on the rock. So, however you see it. My birthday is in September. Any other September people here? It's a good month. September is peak season, pardon the pun, in prime season in Yosemite. All the elite climbers, the best climbers in the world, go to Yosemite in the fall, September, October, to train. They train on those walls. If you ever drive through Yosemite in the fall, you'll see all these little dots going up all the walls. That's, that's what's happening. So my son always takes me on a, a birthday climb, like this one. This is up in uh, Tuolumne. Tuolumne is 4,000 feet higher than Yosemite, which is at 4,000 feet. So Tuolumne is up at 8,000 and a half. And uh, for somebody like me who grew up in a cloud of smoke, it takes me a day or two after I drive up there to get accustomed, to get acclimated, and then we can go and do these exciting adventures. And he has taken, uh, I, I did my homework uh, um, when I started climbing outdoors, I did my homework online to see what climbs are available in my range. I'm not a very good climber and I never, probably never will be because I just, you know, I started late in life. I don't have muscles anywhere. <laughs> so um, I checked for all the moderate climbs all around, the, uh, all around California and most of them, especially all the outstandingly beautiful ones, are in Yosemite, not right in the valley, but in the great, you know, greater, the whole, the whole national park. 
like this one. This one um, I agonized over doing with my son because it's at 12,000 feet. That's pretty thin air. <laughs> And it's really high, and you, it's a seven and a half mile hike to get out to it, which is considerable. And I, a lot of these climbs I do with Alex, my friends here who taught me to climb, basically, they can't go do them because they say things like, well, I don't know, dear, do I think that's too hard for you? Or, oh, or if I hike seven miles, I'm going to sleep first and then climb the next day, you know, just camp out there. Or just plain, they don't know how to find the beginning of the climb. It's not always obvious. It's often very difficult to find the base of a climb. You have to know what you're looking for. Or they don't have the right gear, and Alex has all the gear in the world. So um, that, one, that one was a tough one. This one, anybody know, anybody study geology here? Ever taken a course in geology? A fin, what's a fin? Yeah, that's a fin, yeah. Picture a stegosaurus back. You know what a stegosaurus looks like with all those things on its back? You go up and walk across the top. You walk, you climb up at the end of this fin, you know, here's what it looks like. Straight ground, flat ground, flat ground, fin, it goes straight up. So on both sides of this, we're sitting on the very, very tippy top, on both sides of that, it's 500 feet straight down. So you don't want to fall off. <laughs> You can, you're on a rope. I mean, when we go with me and Alex, we're always on a rope. Alex is not always, but I am. <laughs> but even on a rope, if you fall down the side of a fin, you're gonna bang into every, see all those lumps and bumps and you know dark spots? You're gonna hit all of those, break a lot of bones on your way down. Are we, uh, is that the garbage truck? <laughs> <laughs> half Dome. You've all seen Half Dome, yes? On, cl on calendars or in pictures or movies. Yeah. Uh, half Dome was something that, that Alex suggested. Thank you. Um, actually, the other way. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> and um, can we dim these lights right here? Anybody to dim these? No? Um, anyway, Alex suggested this, and um, I was, oh yeah, we're going to go to Half Dome. But Half Dome has many sides. The, the front, the flat front, is the one that put him on the cover of National Geographic. He free soloed that, which means he did it without ropes, just him. Him in his climbing shoes and his hands. We didn't do that. <laughs> we did this. On, the si on this side, this shoulder of Half Dome, there are moderate climbs that you know, climbers like me can do. Not too many of them, and it's really, really long. On the other side is where the cables are. You've heard about people hiking up the cables to go to the top of Half Dome. That's on the other shoulder. That's how we got down. <laughs> Ever heard of the New Yorker magazine? Yeah? Well, uh, while I was out doing all these outrageous climbs with my son, word got back to them that, hey, Honnold's mom is out there climbing with him. And so they did this cartoon that was in 2011, I think. It, it looks like him, but nobody at this point had ever seen me. And so it doesn't look like me at all. I don't look, I don't climb like that. <laughs> so, one year before all of this nonsense happened, um, I asked Alex, I've been, I've been going to Yosemite for years, decades, decades, many decades. And I looked up and watched the climbers, little dots, and I asked him, Alex, do you think there's any, you know, someday maybe you could get me up Royal Arches. Royal Arches is a big wall, but it's a small big wall. It's only like 16 pitches. A pitch is a rope length, and a rope is about 200 feet-ish, you know, depending on the climb. But so it's a smallish big wall, if you can call it that. And so I thought it might be within my reach to do this, because by then I'd been done all the birthday climbs, 12 pitches, 16, you know, five, 15 pitches. So, uh, and he said, what he always says when I ask him about all those climbs, yeah, sure. <laughs> The first time he said it, you know, I got half tone. I said, you, you think I could climb half tone? Yeah, sure. That's always been his response. It took me many years to figure out what he meant when he said that. 
It was very simple to him. Yeah, sure, if you want to go out and learn what you need to know to do that, sure, let's go do it. Yeah? Because you don't want to go out here if you don't know what you're doing. He knows that, and I know that. So I asked him, and he said, yeah, sure. So we went up Royal Arches, and by this time, they were the crew, the National Geographic film crew was f living with my son. They filmed with him for three years to do this movie, Free Solo. And they followed him around, you know, cinema verité, you know, the, the, the truth, uh, you know, life cinema. What do they call? What do they call cinema verité in English? They call that same. Okay. So they followed him around to the bank, to the doctor's office, to the, to the dent. They, they went everywhere with him. So Alex was going up with mom. So they followed us up. You know. So this picture is a Jimmy Chin picture. You ever heard of Jimmy Chin? World-renowned photographer, videographer, and um, extreme sports person, climber and skier. So he took this picture, and it only took us like a few hours. And on, you know, we, we got to the top, the sun was waning, but it was still gray, you know, we could see. And we're coming down, and we were rappelling down. Remember, rappelling is when you hold your rope and you back down the rope, and we did it together. So we're rappelling down this, and it's not even dinner time yet. You know, it's like six, seven, six-ish in the evening. And I'm thinking to myself, huh. I just did a big wall in pretty good time. I wonder if someday I might do that other big wall that's just two miles down the road, the big, big wall. But I, d I didn't say it to anybody. I didn't even dare really think it. I, I, this is me. I've been a teacher all my life. I never even thought about such things. But I went home, came back here to teach more and, and writing more. And I'm thinking, huh, I did a big wall. I wonder. So the next time Alex came through, I said to him, huh, Alex, do you think by any chance that maybe someday you might you know, lead me up? El I really didn't expect him to say yes. Lead me up El Cap. Just the very notion is kind of laughable. I was, you know, it's me. <laughs> I never thought of myself as an athlete. I, I've got no muscles, you know, upper body strength. But but I have the, the will to do it. And I had the, the will to learn what I needed to know. So I asked him, and, and to my great surprise, he said, what, what do you think he said? Yeah. That's right. Yeah, sure, but you have to learn how to jug. Huh? That, that's what I said, huh, oh, jug. I didn't know what that meant, but I had a yeah, sure, you know? So. He left, went off on another expedition, and I talked to all my climbing friends, said, do you know what jugging is? What's jugging? He said, I have to know how to jug. So I found out, and I got my friends to lend me gear and to maybe let me set up on their trees at their house. This is jugging. You have handles that you hold, and each handle has teeth, and you open them or close them, and you clip that onto the rope. And from that metal handle, there's a strap that comes down to your harness and down to your foot. Two for the right, two for the left. And you push that up with your light, your hand and your foot. You stand on that, push the other side up, and you ladder your way up the rope. Okay? That's called jugging. Climbers call it jugging. It's jumaring. Those handles are called jumars. I think it's a Swiss term. Um, so I learned how to, I, I learned the gear, I knew, knew the vocabulary now, and the, this is the Granite Arch Climbing Center on the right. They let me set up there. And so I did, and the first time I went there, oh God, I was wrecked. I got on the ropes and I, it was only like 25 feet. And I went up, uh, it took me, you know, five, up five feet at a time and I come back down. I, first time my feet left the ground, you're on a rope, the rope bends and, and all of a sudden I'm twisting this. <sighs> By the time I got down from my first attempt, just 25 feet, I was so sore. I couldn't move my shoulders. I couldn't. My hands were bleeding from operating the metal gears with the teeth. My leg was solid black and blue and purple and yellow from all the, the buckles on those straps banging into my leg with each step. And it's your entire body weight, you know, digging those things into your. F oh, I was a wreck. I went home and I'm thinking, oh, I went 25 feet. El Cap is 3,200. <laughs> Do the math. So I did. I did the arithmetic, and I backwards engineered it, and I set up a schedule for myself to be able to go 3,000 feet up doing that very self-same thing. 
This is the first time I tried it outdoors. It was terrifying. My son, I was, I was visiting my son in Las Vegas. He has a house in Las Vegas. And he said, well, mom, we're all going climbing to work on our projects. They call them their projects, the things they try over and over and over until they get it. Uh, you should come with us. There's a photographer's rope. It's hanging down in front of this cave. You can try it. You know, put your drugs on that and, and try it. So I said, okay. So I followed along like a little puppy. You know, all these 20-something climbers in their prime going out to work on their projects. And me, with my little day pack. And, you know, I followed. And we got to this valley. And I looked up. What my son had neglected to mention was that this cave sat a thousand feet up the wall. That's a long distance. A thousand feet up the wall. So we had to first hike up a thousand feet through the cactus, and it's Las Vegas. And I'm, I was in the back. You know, they were all charging up the wall, and I'm, I'm coming. Uh, and we got to the cave, and the rope was in the front of the cave, you know, attached above the, the, the top and hung down. And the photographer was using it. That's how they get those beautiful climbing pictures from up above. You know, the photographer goes up the rope and clips in so that, that they don't move, and then they take pictures. Well, <laughs> I watched the photographer do it first time. He, he got to put his Jumars on the rope, and blah, 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 he was up. Five seconds, he was up the rope. Huh, okay, this is easy. All right. I put my Jumars on the rope, and I went up about five feet, and once your feet leave the ground, you're free spinning. And, I, and then the rope, with the weight of your body, it swung out, and all of a sudden, I'm looking down a thousand feet, hanging on my jugs, thinking, what am I doing here? So it took me, I, the first time, I, maybe I got up 10 feet and then came back. Second time I got on it, I got a little higher, and then the wind picked up. And then I started to spin this way. And then I started to spin this way. And you have no control over that out there. You know, there's nothing, no place to put your feet. You know, I'm in the middle of the air. So I had to learn to make friends with that and just close my eyes and <laughs> blink it away or, or whatever it took. And by the end of the day, I did get up the 90 feet to the top of that cave, darn it. <laughs> so my son wanted to know if I had learned how to jug because I was asking him and a, a friend of his to spend an entire day doing something very, very strenuous just for me, because I wanted to do it. So he wanted to know if I knew how, all right? So I went out there. This is in Yosemite. There's Half Dome in the background. And this is me smiling up at my son, because yes, mom knows how to do this stuff. And I actually did get better at it, and better at it, and better at it. And by the time we did it together out uh, on the practice ropes, there are practice ropes that are always hanging on some of the walls out there on, on El Cap. Um, I actually did know what I was doing, and, I, and he was very happily surprised. <laughs> so there's, this is El Cap. On the left, there's that the formation they call the heart, okay? And the bottom, the point of the heart is a thousand feet off the ground. And from that point down to the ground, there are a se there's a series of six fixed ropes that hang there all the time. There are bolts in the rock permanently, and these ropes are attached to those bolts. And climbers take care of these ropes. They change them when they need it. And you know, uh, the 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 Nat Geo people, you know, who are videographing, videographing, filming my son on the rock. They use those ropes every day, hard. So they replaced all the ropes. And so um, those ropes on the left. On the left there at the heart, and the ropes on the right are where I practiced, where I trained to, to do this. Did you ever wonder, all those people who climb El Cap, and there are over a hundred routes that go up El Cap. There are, it's all mapped out. You, know, you follow a very specific line, uh, a route or a climb. Um, everybody who climbs El Cap comes down the same way. You ever think about that? They don't come down the front. It would be it's impossible to come down the front for a lot of different reasons. So they go up to the top, and they walk across that top. Oh, I think I have a, a thing on this. Yes. No. No, I guess it doesn't work. <laughs> anyway, they walk across the top wherever they arrived. And the top of El Cap is a, a mile and a half wide. I had no clue it was that big. It's a big thing. It's a mile and a half. And our climb was on the left side, the west side, the heart side. So we had to walk the entire mile and a half. 
And so everybody walks to the right, to the east, and they come down the descent ledges, just a series of ledges about, about, about this wide from here to there. And there's big blocks of rocks and trees and things that you have to climb down and, and uh, it's very hard. The, the descent worried me a lot more than going up. I knew I could do the ropes. I knew I could jumar up the ropes. I was doing it every day. I was practicing. The descent worried me far more than that. And with good reason, as it turned out. And at the right, uh, the rightmost arrow on this side, um, is where the other set of, of ropes are. From, uh, come down the ledges to about here. And then, again, there are a set of six fixed ropes on that side. So I alternately practiced that side and that side every week. I set up a training schedule, and I went. I was retired by then from American River, so I, my time was my own. I was just writing at that point. So I went, and for th I spent three days of every week for 18 weeks, like a college course. 18 weeks, right? Three days a week, kind of like a college class. And I went there three days in the middle of every week. I spent one day doing cardio, hiking up the big walls, and then two days, one on that side and one on that side, jogging up the ropes and down, jogging up the ropes and down. Because I, I had to know that I could do 3,000 feet of that. And I knew that I was going to wear out. Because once you've jogged like 1,000 feet, it gets a little slower and a little slower. This is what it looks like um, jogging up to the heart. This is about five or six hundred feet up. That's me. Doesn't that look like fun? <laughs> Does that look scary? Does that look scary to most people? Is that, it looks scary to me. The first time I did it by myself. Oh, see, when you're on, on jugs, you're alone because only one person can be hanging on a rope at one time. So you're, you know, by nature of the sport, you are alone. And the first time I tried it on El Cap, <laughs> At Alex's advice, I was going home from that time you saw that, that green picture where you saw me smiling up at him. That When I left there, I went home. I, I had to pass right in front of El Cap to go home. So Alex said, well, Mom, on your way out, why don't you stop and do the heart lines? <laughs> That's exactly how he says it. To him, this is child's play. It is so easy. He doesn't even put on his climbing shoes when he climbs with me. I should be embarrassed to say that, but it's Alex Honnold. I'm not... So he, yeah, he, what I do on the rocks is so baby-like to him, you know, and so is this. So he said, well, you should stop and do the heart. So I stopped. <laughs> Took me over an hour just to find my way out there. El Cap doesn't sit right at the road. You know, you have to hike up these very strenuous hikes to get to the wall. And then once you're at the wall, which part of the wall are you at? Well, I asked everybody then. And, and the whole area is filled with young guys, you know, 19, 20, 21, 30, walking around with packs the size of refrigerators on their backs. And me, grandma, out there with my little day pack saying, do you know where the heart lines are? Do you know where the heart lines are? <laughs> so they probably thought I was really weird. And, but I finally found the heart line, and, and I got on it the first time. It was terrifying because I was out on El Cap by myself. I knew that Alex knew where I was, but he was up on El Cap somewhere that day. He's always up on El Cap somewhere doing stuff. That's all I get from him. What are you going to do today? Oh, we're going to go do stuff on El Cap. So he was doing stuff on El Cap. I, I couldn't reach him. If anything happened that I didn't know what to do about, that I didn't know how to handle, I was just tough out of luck. I was on my own. And, and things did happen. There was a knot in the first rope. And, and yeah, exactly. And there was a knot in the first rope. And I got to the knot, and I'm thinking, huh, I wonder if this is safe. <laughs> I'm hanging, you know, 500 feet off the ground. There's a knot in the rope. What does that mean? I had read about knots and passed out past them, you know, with, but not with Jumars. And so I'm thinking, well, well, it looks OK. And I eyeballed it. And so I kept going and found out that coming down, going up is fine. You just take your jumar off the bottom, put it on the top. No problem. It's scary, but no problem. Coming down, well, to get your jumars, coming down, you're not on jumars. You're on a, a, a device that has teeth in it also, and you crank it, uh, cam it, and to let yourself down. And you're weighting the rope. Your entire weight is pulling on the rope as you do this. 
Well, when you get to the notch, <laughs> then what? I had to figure that out. It took me over an hour. The tears were pouring down my face. I cried. I tried to call everybody I knew because the uh, the signal is great up there. There's no, <laughs> nothing interferes with the signal up there. You know, Alex has called me from the LCAP many times. And so I, I called everybody. Nobody was, everybody was at work. I couldn't reach anybody. My son was up doing stuff on LCAP. So, so I had to figure it out. So uh, that's... Uh, so this is, this is about five or 600 feet up. Do you remember in the movie when they talked about the videographers down on the ground and they're, you know, they're communicating with each other? They say he's, he's beginning the down climb. Remember that part? He's down climbing to the whatever he was down climbing to. So he went up and then down a little bit to another part of the wall and then followed a crack up. This is the part where, we, where he down climbed from. He, this, this, the, the, the point at which he started to down climb. And this is higher than the heart lines. And it took me, oh, maybe eight or nine weeks to get up the gumption to go, go there. <laughs> but I did once. I did twice, actually. This is what it looks like um, rappelling down from the heart. When you're at the base, when you're standing at the base of El Cap and looking up, you can't see the top because you have all these little sections that hang out like that. Not roofs exactly, but you know they sway overhead and then it goes back in and, and you can't see the top. So uh, I never really saw it until I did it. <laughs> so on June 3rd, my son did his thing and they made movies about it and it won Oscar and it won seven Emmys. Did you know about that one? Oh, many people didn't watch the Emmys. It won an Oscar and seven Emmys and now it's playing in China. Did you know that China has 700 IMAX theaters. It's the biggest market in the world. So he recently got back from China where he did you know, Q&A at some of the movie theaters. So on June 3rd, he did his thing, made history. And on Halloween day, Alex and I climbed El Cap. I became the oldest woman to ever climb El Cap. And it was Halloween day and the climb we did was called Lurking fear. Is that perfect or what? <laughs> we didn't plan it that way. It just happened that that was the name. But uh, lurking, so as you can see, uh, lurking fear is over to the left. You know, way, way over to the left. Remember, El Cap is a mile and a half across the top. So this is what it looks like going up. This is when I was still smiling. <laughs> didn't last too long. <laughs> All right, I'm still smiling. This is about two-thirds of the way up. Can you see us on the picture on the left? You see us? You see us? Red, red is the color of the red is the color of the day, right? There's me. And up, up there <laughs> is Alex. And until I, my friend uh, um, sits out in El Cap Meadow is a big, big, vast meadow uh, where you can lie back and watch all the climbers going up El Cap. And uh, I have a friend who was a climber, and now he stays out there with his telescopic camera and takes pictures of all the climbers on El Cap. And so he took this, these of us. And until I, he sent me these pictures, I had no clue what it looked like. Because when you're on it, all you see is what's in, right in front of you and what you have to concentrate on. And there's so much that you have to concentrate on. The ropes, the knots, the what to clip into. and. All that stuff. So I was glad he said these because I had no idea what it looked like. So, so this is, uh, we do other things besides climbing. How many of you have ever gone up Mount Whitney? Anybody? Nobody? One? Yes, congratulations. That's no mean, thing. you should try it. It's just hiking, <laughs> but it's just hiking. Yeah. Just, just hiking like, like the other stuff is just climbing, you know. Yeah. Um, so today's takeaway, don't let anybody tell you that you're too old, you're too fat, you're too, eh, you're a girl, you're not supposed to do these things. If you think you can do it, you can do it. The end.